Uh, today I'm going to talk about the mapping that's been done in signposts. I'm sure most of you have been aware that we've been flying the farms with a drone for the last two winters and we're going to look now at some of the outputs from that process and some of the information we'll be sharing with the signpost farmers. The original plan was to use the drone cameras and the laser scanners, which I'll talk about in a few slides, to create habitat maps and measures of the carbon stored in the biomass in the farm. Over the last few months, as we've new staff have joined, we've been developing the maps that we've been producing. These have all been hand digitized from the imagery, so they're as bad as accurate as we can make them. And we've been talking to farmers and advisors on how to develop the maps. And the original maps you can see in the right, which some of you may have seen last year, uh, they're perfectly good, but they were considered a little simple and didn't really uh, convey the information that was wanted to be conveyed. So as usual in these cases, we, uh, we redesigned the maps and we put lots more information on the statistics of the of the habitat distribution on the farms. We broke down the habitats into more um, detailed uh, classes and we attempt to try and sit each farm within the scope of the habitats generally on the signpost farms and within the national population. And that's the thing you can see on the right there. But again, as we talk to farmers, um, We've, it was decided that this was now too much information. And so we come to a sort of happy medium and this is what's being produced this week. So this week, these PDFs are now being generated uh, by Eleni, who's the contract technologist on the project. And these uh, show simplified habitats, but with more spatial detail for each farm and each block and each farm, we're dropping out the principal land use. So in this case, it was a tillage farm, I think. And so we can just see the habitats on the farm. And now the PDFs themselves have been what we call geo enabled. So when a farmer or an advisor gets an email with the attachment, if you open up that in your phone and you can use one of the many free apps that are used often for hiking and hill walking, this map now will sh show up and you'll get a little dot that shows you where you are on the farm as you walk around. And if you zoom in, the map follows you. So it's it's a bit more utility without having to get into any great detail of technology and new apps. And what we've tried to do is compare the signpost population of farms with the general population. So again, some of you may be aware last year there was a national land cover map published and this enables us to make rudimentary habitat scores for every farm in the country. So what you do is you you take some of the published literature from our colleagues in Johnstown and we give a value to each habitat found in each farm. We multiply that by the area of the habitat and then divide by the area of the farm and we get a score. And we don't really need to worry about the numbers. Uh, these change for each system. But what we're looking at here in this histogram with the purple bars, it shows you the distribution of scores. And if it's down towards zero, it's got very little habitat on the farm. If it's up towards seven in this case, it's got a lot of habitat. And we can see that 30% of the 125,000 farms in the country have this score of 3.5, it's in the middle. But the important thing to notice on this histogram is how all the bars to the right are higher than all the bars to the left of the center point. And this means that the general population of farms skews towards a higher habitat score than the more the most common value. And again, this is to be expected because a lot of the smaller farms, which each count, um, they have a higher habitat percentage on them than some of the larger farms. And we're counting by farm. So this explains this skew. And now if we look at the signpost farms, we see something slightly different. So again, 3.5 is the middle value, the most common value. But now it's nearly half the farms have this value. And these light coloured bars to the left you see are higher than the ones on the right. So this tells us that more signpost farms have a lower habitat value than the middle value than, the, than are above it. And this tells us again something not unexpected, but now we have figures that generally speaking the signpost farms have a lower habitat value 
than the overall population of Irish farms. And the whole intent of the signpost programme, or one of them, is to shift this histogram slightly to the right. As well as the habitats, we've also been looking at carbon and we're using laser scanners to do this. And laser scanners give us a 3D model of the farm. And what you can see here is one of the farms and we fly in and we can see this 3D nature of the, the hedgerow there. And this isn't a picture. It's been made up by all the single individual laser points bouncing off leaves and branches within the hedgerows and off the ground and off the crops. And if we zoom into the back there, we can see individual points. There's a single laser point bouncing off a leaf. It gives us the structure of the plant and the hedgerow and the tree. It gives us the height, the width, the crown density, the crown width. And it's with all these different values, all these different measurements of the geometry of the hedgerow and the tree that we can then use those to calculate carbon. Now we split the hedgerows into two types. Uh, if it's been topped, we use a method for calculating carbon that was developed in Johnstown Castle uh, and published last year by our colleagues there. Um, if the hedgerow has a canopy or if we can see little trees within it, then we treat it differently. We treat it like a sort of linear woodland and we use a slightly different method. And this is one of the examples from one of the farms. This farm here has 389 tonnes of carbon trapped in its hedgerows. And it's important to remember this is the carbon stored. It's nothing to do with how much carbon is added. Hedgerows only add carbon, only store extra carbon if they're allowed to grow. But on average, they can be between one and two tonnes of carbon per hectare for a hedgerow. And in this case, if this farm was allowed its hedgerows to grow out for a year, it would add 10, 11 tonnes of carbon to its stock. And that's not insignificant. But what happens if we remove a hedgerow? So this is one of the uh, farms and the hedgerow there in the, in the red ellipse. Uh, it's a basic hedgerow. It's 180 metres long. It's average height of 1.7. It's but it contains 2.3 tonnes of carbon. If you were to grub that hedgerow up and even following the rules, replacing it by twice its length of a new hedgerow, it would still take 12, 15 years to get back to the carbon you'd lost when you originally grubbed up the hedgerow. And that's before you even start to add extra carbon. So taking away a carbon is one of the worst thing you can do for your carbon budget on your farm. What can we do with the hedgerows? Well, here's another example, a take home message. This is a 3D image of one of our uh, signpost farms. Two hedgerows, one in the foreground, one in the background. They're both about the same length, but the topped hedgerow in the foreground only contains four tons of carbon, whereas the hedgerow at the back, which is bigger, it's got individual trees in it, has got 16 tons of carbon. If you made the hedgerows in the front, like the hedgerows in the back, you would make significant changes to your carbon store and significant advances in the carbon sequestration on the farm, as well as having major habitat and biodiversity benefits. Thank you for the questions. Again, I'm sorry I'm not there, but if you have any follow up, you can contact me on the email address below. Thank you.